All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to introduce multidimensional arrays, and we'll also talk about searching and sorting. Please make sure you have first reviewed our previous two lectures on one dimensional arrays. You'll see that this video continues to build on the topics from our previous lectures. So here's our goals for today's video. First, we want to practice how to write programs and functions using single dimensional arrays or 1D arrays, as well as multi dimensional arrays. So we'll introduce what multi dimensional arrays are and we'll learn how to write programs with them. We're also going to start talking about how we can sort data in our arrays. We'll talk about three sorting algorithms called selection sort, bubble sort, and insertion sort. We'll learn about how these algorithms work, and you'll be able to recognize how these algorithms are able to sort data. Finally, we will briefly introduce what's called Big O notation. And this is a way of comparing algorithm performance. So please note that here we are just introducing some initial ideas about sorting algorithms and big O notation. If you take more advanced programming classes in the future, you're going to learn about a lot more algorithms and go into big O notation in much greater detail. Here our goal is to just introduce the basics. So before we dive into the new material, let's do a quick practice program to review what we've learned so far. So far, we have learned how to use 1D arrays, and we've also learned how to use 1D arrays and functions. So let's try a quick practice question to write a function definition. Here we are asked to write a function definition for the function below. We have a void type function called get array from file. And this function accepts a 1D int array and a file name as its arguments. And in the precondition and postcondition, we can see what we're trying to do. Essentially, what we want to do is we have some data file, let's just call it file name for now, and say our file name contains some ints. We want to be able to open this file name and copy the data into our array named array. So this function get array from file should read each item from my data file and store each int in that file as an element in my array. We can also assume that we have some global constant named size. So we're assuming that this global constant size must be declared and initialized. So we will basically read our data file and put up to size elements inside our array. So let's go ahead and see how we could write a function like this using what we know about arrays, loops, and functions. So I went ahead and put our function declaration inside an empty, empty program here. And you can see I have declared a constant named size and initialized it to store 200 for its initial value. And then I also have my 
declaration for get array from file as we saw in our practice question. Notice we also can assume that the include fstream and string headers are also required here, so I have added those to my program. Let's go ahead and start writing the definition for this get array from file function. Remember the definition will go after the main function. So let's go ahead and start writing our definition for get array from file in the function definition body. Let's briefly walk through the steps that we need to complete. Remember, when we're working with files, we first need to declare an input file stream object. So we need to actually be able to access that data in our files. We also probably want to declare some variables to hold the value read from the file. So I'll say an int variable next to store the next value read from the file. So we want to have that. Once we have declared our input file stream objects, then we need to open the data file and actually read the contents. And so to read the contents, we can use a while loop like before. And we can keep reading until we have read all the items from the file. But we want to be a little careful, because what happens if our data file contains more items than we have room for in the array? Here, let's just assume our data file has only up to size items. Otherwise, we would need to have some sort of break statement or some code to keep us from reading too many values. So we read the contents using a while loop. And then finally, once we have read all of our data, then we need to close the input file. So we know how to do most of these tasks already. To declare an input file stream object, we need our fstream header, which we have. And then we can just declare our input file stream object. I will call it infile. And then we also need an int variable called next value. I'll just call it next. This is just an int to hold the next value read from the file. Now we need to open our data file. So like before, we'll just use infile.open, and we will open our data file named file name. If we wanted to, we could also check for file opening errors. Oops, and be careful here. I had a little typo, so in file is our input file stream object. In file.open will open our file name. And to read the contents, we'll use a while loop. So we can write while in file reads the next item. Then we need to copy next into the array. So what we can do is we can simply say array element i is equal to next. So here, notice we should probably add a couple more variables. Let's add another int variable i, and we'll use this to count how many values read from the file and to track 
the index when storing data in our array. So while in file reads the next item, we'll set array element i to next, and we'll increment our counting variable i. The other thing we can do is to prevent out of range errors. We can use a break statement if i becomes greater than the size. So if we if we have too many items in our data file and our counting variable i becomes greater than or equal to our size, then we can break and output some error message like maximum number of values has been read. I'll go ahead and put that first so that it triggers before the break. So as long as we haven't read too many items, then we will copy the next value into our array and increment our counting variable. Once we're done, we just need to say in file.close. And then we will have successfully read all of our data from the file. So as you can see, it's actually pretty straightforward to use arrays, functions, and data files together. The important thing is that you make sure you follow all our best practices. You know, we have to manipulate our arrays element by element. We still need to keep track of our counting variables and things like that. But otherwise, these are all tools that we already know. So I highly recommend that you try going back and coding this up yourself. And you could even try testing it out using a main function and a data file. All right, let's go ahead and continue on. So next, let's go ahead and we'll introduce multidimensional arrays. And then after that, we will practice our multidimensional sandbox. And we'll move on to searching and sorting. So you might be thinking, why would we use a multidimensional array? When I think of multidimensional arrays, I like to visualize a table in a spreadsheet with rows and columns. A table in a spreadsheet is an example of a two dimensional array because we use one index to designate rows and a second index to keep track of columns. You can also visualize a multidimensional array, like one of these bookshelves that has rows and columns of spaces in order to hold different items. The convention we typically use in our class is we have the first set of square brackets indicate the number of rows. So basically, in this case, that gives us our vertical portion of the array, that is our rows. And then columns is defined by the second index in that array. So the second item in square brackets gives us our number of columns. And you'll notice that otherwise, the naming convention is the same. So the very first row, very first column is given 0, 0. And the very last row, very last column will have index n minus 1, where in this case, n would be the maximum number of rows or columns. So for this array exams with five rows and four columns, 
the highest index would be rows equal four, columns equal three. All right, so the good news is multidimensional arrays follow similar rules as one-dimensional arrays. So just like with one-dimensional arrays, you declare a multidimensional array by first specifying your base type. So that could be like an int or double, followed by the name, and then putting the number of elements. The difference is you have to specify multiple dimensions using multiple sets of square braces. For example, if I declare a double type multidimensional array called my grid, and I want to have 10 rows and five columns, then I would declare it like that. Or if I want a char type array called letter grades with three rows and 10 columns, then I could do it like that. Remember, you could also use global constants to specify the number of rows and columns in an array. And you're not limited to the number of dimensions. As noted here, you can, most commonly we have two dimensions, but sometimes we can have more than that. For example, you could have some sort of plot. You could have like double my data, and you could have, for example, x, y, and z values. So you can have kind of your rows, columns, and then this third dimension would be like the depth of those columns. A good example of this is actually in images. If you have an array called pixels, you could have one array for rows, second dimension for columns, and a third dimension for RGB, where this is your red, green, or blue value for that pixel. We'll talk more about applications of these multidimensional arrays in a future video. The thing to remember here is that the index numbering follows the same convention as 1D arrays. So every index must start at zero, and the last number of that index will be n minus one, where n is the number of values. Let's take a look at another example. So here, if I declared an array named exams with four rows and three columns, so notice here I'm just using global constants to specify rows and columns. If I want to access an item inside this two-dimensional array, I have to use two subscripts to access the element. Remember, we're using the convention that the first subscript is our row. So we have row zero, one, two, and three. And our second subscript gives us our column, zero, one, two. So in this case, exams row two, column two, that would actually give us the value in our third column over and second from the bottom. If I say exams 2, 2 is 86, that would put the value 86 in that location. So otherwise, the approach you would use to basically manipulate these arrays is very similar to what we already know with 1D arrays. We just have, in this case, multiple rows and columns of data. So when would we actually use multidimensional arrays? 
So they're actually really convenient. And programmers use multidimensional arrays all the time. So for example, maybe you're working on a database. Maybe you want to track sales from five different stores and a hundred different product ID numbers. What you can actually do is declare an array like these, where you could have your sales data and you could sort it by store ID and product ID. If you want to track more things, all you need to do is add another dimension. For example, if you want to track sales also over the month, then you add another dimension for the store. And similarly, you could even go by month and department. So arrays and multidimensional arrays are especially useful when we want to basically organize sets of data with a lot of different parameters and a lot of different values inside of there. So let's go ahead and try a couple quick practice questions. First practice question. How would you declare the two-dimensional array named time grid with three rows and four columns of double variables? Take a moment and pause the video. See if you can identify the correct answer. So what did you get? In this case, remember if we want three rows and four columns, the number of rows is listed first. So the correct syntax would be double time grid with three and four like this. Correct answer would be choice A. Let's try another. Suppose I have an array named exams. Which number in this grid would correspond to exams element one, two? Take a moment and see if you can identify the correct answer. Well, let's go ahead and number the rows and columns. Remember, the row numbering and column numbering starts at zero. So in this case, exams row one, column two, would give us the number 99. Make sure you remember to start your numbering with row zero and column zero. Otherwise, you might get an off by one error. Next, let's talk a little more about manipulating 2D arrays. It's actually pretty straightforward to manipulate 2D arrays. Usually what we do is we use nested for loops. So a loop inside a loop. And we'll demonstrate this more on a future example. It's also possible to initialize 2D arrays using the curly braces and the notation, but this is much less common. So for the purposes of our class, you should use a for loop. So please, for our class, always use a for loop to initialize element by element. One thing to note is if you ever were using braces to initialize a 2D array, any elements that were not given an initial value would be set to zero. But that is only for when you are using the curly braces to initialize. Once again, for our class, you should always be using a for loop to initialize your 2D arrays. It's generally just much more efficient. So let's go ahead 
and take a look at an example of manipulating 2D arrays using what I call the multidimensional sandbox. Let's go through this code line by line and really try to understand what's happening here. So in this multidimensional sandbox program, you can see that we've written a bunch of example code here to help you familiarize yourself with multidimensional arrays. We first declared one constant named max rows and a second constant named max columns. These two constants can be used as global constants that we can actually specify our rows and columns in our array. And so first, we have some code that will initialize all elements in our array to zero. And you can see essentially what we're doing is we have two for loops. Our outer for loop is incrementing from row zero to row max rows, minus one, and our inner for loop is incrementing columns. And you can see that what we're trying to do is initialize each element of my grid to contain the number zero. So let's briefly draw what is actually happening when we use these nested for loops. So in this case, let's go ahead and assume that in this case we have max rows is five and max calls is four. So let's just go ahead and assume those values for our convenience. And if we do that, then our array my grid will look something like this. My grid is going to have four columns and it's going to have five rows. So this is our my grid array. So remember the columns are the vertical and the rows are the elements here. So five rows, four columns. So when we write this code to modify the elements inside my grid, what we're essentially doing is we are going through element by element and updating the data. So let's assume that we are at row zero. So in the outermost for loop, we start at row zero. And then when we're in row zero, then the inner for loop is going to execute. So when our inner for loop triggers, we're going to go from column zero to column max calls, and we're going to assign row zero column call the value zero. So this code inside inside my for loop, that line of code is going to assign zero, 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 zero. This will update one row to have each column to be zero. So basically the inner for loop will update each column of a given row to have the value zero. So we're going through for all my columns in row zero, set each column, column zero, one, two, three, set each column equal to zero. Once that's done, then I go back to my outer for loop and now I repeat for the next row. So then my for loop runs again, this time I go to my row number one, and then I update my next column, zero, 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 zero. So now I'm in row one, update row one's columns to all be zeros. Then I move on to my next one. 
I move on to row two. And so notice little by little, I'm updating each row and then all the columns in that row to be initialized to zero. So therefore, by looking at these, this nested for loop, you can see that a two-dimensional array is basically just an array of one-dimensional arrays. And then those rows are stacked together to form a two-dimensional grid. And then similarly, if we want to output our data using the next for loop, it's the same idea. Notice what we would do is we start our for loop looking at our row number zero. And then inside row number zero, we start reading each column. So we read first row zero, column zero, row zero, column one, row zero, column two, row zero, column three. So this code would actually output row number zero as zero, 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 zero. Then row number one as zero, 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 and so on. So I highly recommend you take some time and play around with these nested for loops until you get a really good sense of how they work. Remember, essentially what we're doing here is we are updating each row one at a time, update all the columns in that row, and then the outer for loop moves us to the next row. So that explains how we first initialize our elements and how we output the elements to the screen. If we run this code, you can see that's indeed what we get. We first initialize our array and get a grid of zeros. And then we have some additional manipulation to further play around with our arrays. So suppose we want to update our array so that each item is numbered. So here I have some code. Now let's update our array. So each item is numbered from 0 to our maximum minus 1. If I want to number each element in my array, I need some counting variable number to keep track as we number each of the elements. And then you can see that I use a similar set of nested for loops as before. So I output my row number, and then notice I go through in my nested for loop, I assign each element the appropriate number, and then I also need to increment my number before I move to the next element. So this is going to start at row 0, column 0, give row 0, column 0 the number 1, or I'm sorry, give row 0, column 0 the number 0, then number gets incremented to 1, then column is going to keep incrementing until we get to the maximum. So this will increment 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in our first row and continue down. The output will look like this. Oops, and notice, since we only have four columns, our numbering goes from 0 to 3, and then we move to our next row. So you can see the way these nested for loops work is we start at row 0, column 0, and we number each row moving from left to right. Then we move downward to number the next set. So we do 0, 1, 2, 3 in row 0, then we go to row 1, do 4, 5, 6, 7, move to row 2, go 8, 9, 10, 11, and so on. You can also do the same thing, but in reverse. So here, just for fun, notice what we did is we have the same exact approach, except we start our counting variable number at the maximum value. And then each time we update an item in our array, we decrease our counting number by one. If we do that, then we'll end up having 19 be our first 
element in row zero, column zero, and we count downward until we get to zero at the very end. So I highly recommend that you try going through this program and practice manipulating this data. It's especially helpful to see how we're able to add these headings for row number inside our outer for loop because we can put our row number and then also process each column within that row. Notice I also put a new line so that after a given row has been processed, we move to a new line before continuing our for loop on the next row. Notice there's also some funny things you can do. Suppose you want to only modify the data in the perimeter of your array. Well, remember the perimeter of our array is where we have our row equal to zero or max rows minus one, and our column is equal to zero or max columns minus one. So if I want to modify only the values in my perimeter, I can add an if statement and I can check if I am in a perimeter row or column. So if row is zero, column is zero, row is max rows minus one, or column is max calls minus one. If I'm in a perimeter element, then I can process that element differently. If I run that nested for loop, notice that will allow me to add a border of zeros only in the perimeter of that array. So you can be really clever with these nested for loops, and you can add a lot of interesting little features by using well-designed if statements. So I highly recommend that you play around with this array sandbox. It's really, really good practice to try building these programs for yourself from scratch and make sure you really understand how these arrays are being manipulated. So let's cover a couple more useful tricks about our multi-dimensional arrays. One trick that I like to do for two-dimensional arrays is to name my row and column variables row and call instead of i and j. A lot of people like to use i for their row counter and j for the column counter in the 2D array, but i and j are sometimes not very descriptive. So if you actually call your nested for loops row and call, it's a little easier to keep track. For example, if I have that array, int my grid with say three rows and two columns. That would and if I wanted to initialize this my grid array, I could write for loops like this for int row equals zero, row is less than three, row plus plus. And then inside that for loop, I have my second for loop, int column equals zero, call is less than two, column plus plus. And then inside there, I can actually put, for example, my grid row call. equal, and let's just say row plus call. So this would set the elements of my grid to hold the value row number plus column number. So this is another way that is helpful to visualize 
what your counting variables are doing. If you name them row and column, it's easier to tell that the outer for loop is stepping through your rows and the inner for loop is incrementing your columns. So now let's talk a little bit more about multidimensional arrays and functions. It turns out that multidimensional arrays work very similarly as one-dimensional arrays when using functions. So there's a couple important rules that are a little bit different. In multidimensional arrays, if you're calling a function that uses that array, then once again, you just use the array's name when calling a function with that array. But when you are plugging in an array as an argument in a function, notice for a 2D array, you have multiple sets of square braces. The size of the array in that first dimension is actually optional. So you can choose to leave the size out or you can put it in. If you do not specify the size of the first dimension in those square brackets, then you would need to give an extra parameter inside the function to give the size of that first dimension. Or you'd need a global constant. And then any other remaining dimensions, so like your columns or third, fourth, fifth dimension, those must be given in the square brackets. And just like before, functions will not know the size of the multidimensional array unless you tell it those dimensions. So you want to make sure you either have a global constant or you pass in extra int values to tell your function how big your multidimensional array is. Let's go ahead and try a couple examples of a multidimensional array and writing some functions. One of the best ways to get better at writing functions with 2D arrays is to really practice. So let's write a couple practice functions just for fun. So in this first example, we want to write a void function called output data. Output data will accept an array named my data with rows, rows, and columns, columns as its argument. And the void function output data should output the contents of my data to the screen in a grid pattern with each row on a new line and each column separated by a tab. So just for fun, I'm going to go ahead and write my function definition inside my program for the array sandbox. I'm also going to move my global constants max rows and max calls to be global instead of only located in main. Let's go ahead and write the declaration for this function output data. So I have my function named output data. And we know that output data should accept an array as its argument. And here we're told we're told that the array my data is double type. And we'll go ahead and assume that it has max rows, max rows rows, and max calls columns. And we also need to include our precondition and postcondition. So our precondition will be that my data is a double type array with max rows, rows, and max calls columns. And of course, we need those global constants, max rows 
and max calls are global constants initialized to positive values. And then our post condition is we're just outputting the contents of my data to the screen in a grid pattern. And here, each row is on its own line, and each column separated by a tab. So there's our declaration. Let's now write our definition after our main function. So remember, our function output data just needs to output the data that is stored in that array my data. We already have access to max rows and max calls because they are global constants. So here we just need to use nested for loops to output the data to the screen. So we can go for int row equals zero, row is less than max rows, row plus plus. That is going to process each row starting with row zero. And then for each row, we need to process each column. So So here we're going to process each column within a given row. So here, within one row, we're going to go from left to right and process all the columns. And what do we want to do? We want to output, using a cout statement, we want to output those values to the screen. So we'll output my data element row element call. So this will output my data row row column call to the screen. We also want to make sure that each column is separated by a tab. So to do that, we just have an escape sequence for tab. So each column will be outputted with a tab in between. And we want to add a new line between each row. So notice before, before our row for loop ends, that would be, we have our for loop here for our columns. We close that for loop with some curly braces. But before moving to the next column, before moving to the next row, add a new line. So this way, what the loops are going to do is we process each row starting with row zero. We output all the columns for that row separated by a tab. And then we add a new line before moving to our next row. Just for fun, we can try calling our output data function on one of our arrays inside our sandbox. So let's go ahead and just for fun, we can just say output data. Let's try calling output data on the migrate array. Ah, notice 
the issue we have here is we had actually set up this function to be for double type, but notice my grid is an int type. So let's just quickly change our my grid, our function here to be accepting int type just for the purposes of this example. And then if we do that, we will see that output data will work. So we need to make sure that the type of array that our function accepts is the same as we're actually trying to use in the function call. And if we do that, we see when we call output data, we are able to properly output the contents in that array. Let's go ahead and do one more example of multidimensional arrays and functions. Suppose we have that same function my data, or I'm sorry, that same array my data with rows, rows, columns, columns. Suppose we want to write a function called calc average, which will accept an array and return the average of its numbers as a double. Let's go ahead and write this function in our array sandbox. So to do this, let's go ahead and use a similar approach as before. Since my sandbox is using int type arrays, I'm going to go ahead and use an int type array as the argument here. I can declare that function called calc average. It's going to be returning a double type value. And preconditions and postconditions are similar. We need the same preconditions as we had with output data. The post condition is we're going to return the average of the values in my data. And we also need to assume that there will be at least one value to avoid dividing by zero. So let's go ahead and code up calc average. So we can put the definition just underneath our other function definitions. So here we have void calc average. Oops, and I'm sorry, it's not void type, it is double type in this case. In order to calculate the average, we need to declare a summing and counting variable. So we can declare, in this case, let's initialize our sum to zero and have a counting variable count, which we also initialize to zero. Then we need to count the values in our array and determine the sum. The average will be sum divided by count. So in this case, what do we do? Well, we use some nested for loops. So we can go through and we can go process each row of our array and then each column. So notice we're processing each column within a given row. And what do we want to do? We want to calculate the cumulative sum. So we need to add each element to sum. That means sum is going to be equal to sum plus, in this case, our array's name is my data. So we're adding each element, each row and column, we are adding to that cumulative sum. And we also need to increment the counting variable. So we go through, we read each element of our array, every row and column, we add those to our cumulative sum, and we count how many we process. Then all we need to do is return. sum divided by count will give us our average.
Just for fun, let's try calling calc average on the data that we had processed before. Let's go ahead and go like this, see how the average is. And we'll just call calc average to have it output directly into our C out state. Let's go ahead and give this a try. Let's see what we get for our average. We call calc average and we determine the average of those 20 values in my output data array or in my my migrate array will be the sum of these. We get the average is 2.85. And try practicing these examples on your own. See if you can also add more capabilities, like calculating maximum and minimum, or maybe excluding the even numbered values and stuff like that. You'll find that as you practice writing for loops and playing with multidimensional arrays, it will become a lot easier and a lot more intuitive. So definitely take that time to practice and feel free to reach out if you have more questions. Let's now finish up with our last topic for today, which is sorting algorithms. Turns out there are two main kinds of sorting algorithms. And I call them the dumb sorting algorithms, which are very slow, and not super efficient. And then there are smart sorting algorithms, which are generally very efficient and very fast. Please note that this is just my opinion. These are not official categories for sorting algorithms. So note that these are not official categories. So if you are doing a coding interview, make sure you don't just call them dumb or smart algorithms. And how would you be able to tell them apart? Well, generally, the less efficient dumb algorithms will have some sort of sorted portion and some unsorted portion. You might also be wondering, well, if dumb algorithms are so inefficient, why would I bother to learn them? It turns out that dumb algorithms might not be the most efficient, but if you just need something quick, and you don't care too much about efficiency, sometimes a dumb algorithm works just fine. If you need something really fast and really efficient, then you might want to take the time to code up a smart algorithm. So in our class, we're going to go ahead and cover three sorting algorithms. There's actually many different sorting algorithms out there that you'll learn about if you take more advanced programming classes. But in our class, I only expect you to know these three algorithms. First is selection sort, then bubble sort, and finally, insertion sort. All of these algorithms are actually considered to be dumb algorithms because they are not the most efficient but they're pretty straightforward to code up and the algorithm is very simple. If you're wondering about the best smart algorithms, you can look them up. The kind of the gold standard smart algorithms are quick sort and merge sort. If you're curious, you can read about them, but you don't need to know about quick sort and merge sort for this course. For now, I only expect you to know about selection sort insertion sort, and bubble sort. I mentioned that we care about efficiency for algorithms. And in order to compare algorithms and compare their efficiency, we need to have some way to quantitatively compare different algorithms. And so how we do this is we use something called big O notation. You'll learn more about this if you take data structures class. Big O is used to help us quantifiably compare 
how efficient different algorithms are. What Big O does is it tells us how the number of comparisons increases as the size of our data set or the size of our list increases. The best possible efficiency would be O of 1. This means that we would only need one comparison in order to search a list of any size. So we could directly look up a value without having to do any comparing or any searching. Next example is O of n, and that means that the number of comparisons we need will increase linearly as our list increases from 0 to n values the number of comparisons we need would also increase from 0 to n. Finally, the least efficient are the, the algorithms that are closer to O of n squared, or O of log n. In O of n squared, the number of comparisons increases quadratically as our list size increases. And finally, O log n means that the number of comparisons we need increases by log of n. One example of this would be the binary search or binary sort algorithm, where the size of the list is reduced by one half with each iteration. So that would be an example where we had log of n. It would basically require 2 to the n comparisons in order to find and sort a list of n items. So the algorithms we're going to learn about today, they actually have O of n squared as their big O. So our algorithms are not going to be the most efficient. But you'll see that the approach they use is still effective, and it's fairly straightforward to code up these sorting algorithms. So let's go ahead and briefly review selection sort, bubble sort, and insertion sort. First is selection sort. And you can see in this animation how selection sort works. First, selection sort searches for the minimum value in our array. It finds that minimum value, and it swaps the minimum value with the item in the first or topmost position. Then we repeat. So we search the rest of the array for the next minimum. And finally, we keep repeating such that the minimum value is placed in the next position, until the entire array is sorted. So you can see what's happening here is that with each cycle of selection sort, the size of the array which we're searching shrinks by one element with each iteration. It's also worth noting that selection sort isn't smart enough to detect if our array is already ordered it's still going to go through and try to sort all of the values in that array. So let's go ahead and walk through an example of selection sort, and we'll see how it works step by step. You should be able to be familiar with selection sort and how it works. I might ask you some basic questions about these algorithms in a future exam. So remember that how selection sort works is we first find the minimum value in our array, and we swap that minimum value with the item in the first position of our array. So in this case, our minimum value in our example here is 1, so we swap so that our minimum value 1 becomes listed first. So that completes the very first round of selection sort.
So next, selection sort will continue to run until all of the items in that array have been sorted. So now our very first item is sorted, but we still have four other items which have not been sorted. We now search for the minimum value in the next part of our array. So our next minimum is five. So we go ahead and we perform the swap. Item five gets swapped with 81. And then that concludes our second, our second round of selection sort. Now we have two items, the one and the five are fully sorted, but you'll see we still have this unsorted portion containing three more numbers. So we run again, we find our next minimum value and swap it. So once again, oops, and so here we have 999 and 81. So our result will be like that. And then finally, for the very last step, we find our last minimum and we swap it. And of course, our very last value will be sorted automatically since there's nothing left to swap it with. So that shows the whole sequence of steps on how we would perform a selection sort. The idea is we find the minimum value and swap it with the item in the first position and keep repeating until we have processed the entire array. So how would this look in C++? One of the best ways to do selection sort in C++ is to write a few different functions to help you execute the tasks. Remember that swap values function? If we have two integers and we use pass by reference, it can be really helpful to write functions that will process each task of selection sort. So if we want to code up selection sort, we can write one function called swap values, which will swap values when we want to interchange values. We have another function that will find the index of the smallest element in our array. We have a function that will actually allow us to initialize an array. And then we have our sorting function that actually performs the selection sort. So all it takes is a few well-designed functions and some for loops in order to perform selection sort. Let's briefly demonstrate selection sort in C line. So here's our example code for selection sort. We first prompt our user to give us an array, so we call this fill array function in order to fill up our array with different numbers, and we keep filling the array until the user has given us all the numbers we want, or until the user has given us a negative number. Once we have called the fill array function, then we go ahead and we call our sort function, and this performs selection sort. Notice what it does is it basically goes through and it will find the index of this next smallest value in that array, and then it performs a swap so that the smallest value is placed in the very first position. And then it will repeat until all the values in our array have been processed. And again, swap values and index of smallest, just use pass by reference to swap the values. And index of smallest will simply take our for loop and it will search until it finds the smallest item in our array. If we go ahead and run this, we can first enter some numbers. So just put some random numbers. So here's a bunch of random numbers. 
and then I'm going to give it a negative number at the end. And notice selection sort will correctly sort all the items in my array. In reality, we don't use selection sort that often because it's not very efficient. Usually insertion sort or some of the smart algorithms are more efficient. But if you have a relatively small amount of data to sort, or you don't really care about how long the sorting takes, then it's actually not too bad. Selection sort is considered to be O of n squared because the number of comparisons the algorithm, algorithm needs to make increases approximately, approximately by n squared when our data set contains n items. That's because as our list grows, we need to make basically n squared more comparisons. Let's do a couple quick practice questions. First one here is asking, what will this array look like after one iteration or one pass of selection sort? So let's just assume that selection sort is allowed to swap one item in the array. So you'll remember that selection sort is going to find the minimum value, which in this case is three, and it's going to swap it with the item in the first position. So in our case, the three will be listed first, and the 10 will take three's original location, and our result will look like that. So correct answer here is choice B. Let's try another practice. We mentioned that the big O notation uses number of comparisons in order to sort the array. So how would I calculate the number of comparisons needed to sort the array shown using selection sort? To do this, it's actually fairly straightforward. Notice for our first cycle, we have to compare number 10 with four things, right? We have to compare 10 with 55, 999, 3, and 27. So our first run will have four comparisons. And then after we have done that first run, then the first item will be sorted. Our next item must be compared with the remaining three things. Then after that, 999 is compared with two things. And finally, lastly, we have one comparison. So in this case, the number of comparisons that I need to sort my array using selection sort will be 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. Let's now move on and cover bubble sort. So bubble sort is also considered to be a dumb algorithm because it's not the most efficient, but it's actually really interesting how it works. What we do is we read our array from left to right or top to bottom, basically from smaller index to larger index. And we compare adjacent values two at a time. And what we do is we swap the adjacent values as needed so that the smaller value is listed first. Then we continue processing our array, so we keep repeating until the entire array has been sorted. So notice what's happening here is we swap, so the five and the three swap, because three, three is smaller. The one is smaller, so it gets swapped with the five. 
then our five is already smaller than six, so no swap happens there. Six is smaller than seven, we don't swap. Seven and two swap. And then finally, the seven and four will also swap. So you can see what happens here is that with each cycle or each iteration of this bubble sort process, the unsorted portion shrinks by one element. And we see that the sorted portion appears at the end of the array. Essentially, the larger items sink to the bottom of the array, and the smaller items sort of bubble up to the top of the array. A couple other things to note about bubble sort is that there's multiple types of bubble sort. We can have the larger or heavier items sink to the bottom. We can also design it such that the larger items rise to the top of the array. And note that if our array is already sorted, bubble sort is not going to be able to tell. It's still going to want to keep sorting. Notice here, in this example, our array is already sorted, but bubble sort's going to keep reading the values, and it wants to make sure that every value has been read. It won't be able to tell and end early if our values finished sorting before we finished reading. So why do we call it bubble sort? Bubble sort was developed by Don Newth at Stanford. And basically, he called it bubble sort because the larger values are regarded as heavier, and they sink to the bottom of our array, or sink to the bottom of our list. Then the smaller values are regarded as lighter, and we see that they bubble up to the top of the list. So that's why we call it bubble sort. Let's go through an example. So remember in bubble sort, what we do is we read our array two values at a time, and we swap values as needed so that the smaller value is always listed first. We will see in this example that in this first pass, our largest number 999 will sink to the bottom slot of our array. So we start by comparing 5 and 81. We do not swap because 5 is already listed first. We then compare 81 and 1. 1 is smaller than 81, so we perform a swap. So we move 1 in front of 81. Then we move to the next set of values. 999 is larger, it's listed last, so we don't do anything there. And finally, 999 is smaller, I'm sorry, 999 is larger than 65, so we perform a swap. And our largest value has sunk to the bottom of our array. We then repeat bubble sort on the remaining values. So remember, 999 is already sorted. So we perform bubble sort on the rest of the unsorted portion. We mentioned earlier that the DUM algorithms often have this division between the sorted and unsorted portion, like what we see here. So in our second round of bubble sort, we continue reading values two at a time. Five is larger than one, so we swap it so that one is listed first. Then we compare five and 81. We don't need to swap that. Finally, we compare 81 and 65. 65 is smaller, so 65 gets swapped. And now our sorted portion contains two items. So once again, we continue with the last three items in our unsorted portion. And we see that these items are already listed in decreasing order, but bubble sort 
isn't smart enough to recognize that, so it's just going to keep reading. And same with the fourth pass. It's going to keep reading, make sure everything's in order. And then finally, our sort is complete. And of course, the last item, number one, is automatically in the correct location because there's nobody else left for it to swap with. Couple observations about bubble sort. First, plain old bubble sort is not smart enough to detect when no more swaps are necessary or when the array is sorted. So regular bubble sort is going to keep comparing array values until it has finished reading the entire array. You can imagine if you have millions and millions of items in your data set, it could take a while for bubble sort to finish. Let's look at an example of the bubble sort algorithm. Once again, this algorithm is actually fairly straightforward to program in C++. We just need to use some for loops and some arrays. So in our bubble sort program, you can see that we have one function to help us initialize an array with some values. And then we declared a function called bubble sort that actually performs the sorting. So we initialize our array with our fill array function. And notice that bubble sort can actually be performed using just one nested for loop. So what we do is we compare the jth value to the value that comes after. And we see essentially that if our current value is greater than the one that comes after, then we perform a swap. So we use a temporary variable to help us exchange the values in, inside our array. This will allow us to send our largest number toward the bottom of the array, and our smaller numbers will rise to the top. Let's go ahead and run bubble sort. Once again, I'm being prompted to give the program some numbers to sort, so I'm just going to write in a bunch of random numbers. So a bunch of random numbers, and then I give it a negative number to stop. And you can see that bubble sort is successfully able to put our numbers in increasing order. This question asks, what will this array look like after one pass of bubble sort? So what we mean is reading the array from top to bottom and allowing one item to bubble completely down. So remember, what's going to happen is we're going to compare pairs of values and swap them. So 77 is larger than 22. So first, these two will be swapped. And then next, we will read the values that follow. So we'll compare 77 and 999. No swap will happen because 999 is already smaller. Then we compare 999 and 11. Since 11 is smaller, we have to list 11 first. Finally, we compare 999 and 32. And notice the 32 will be listed first. 999 will sink to the bottom. And that will be the end of our first pass. So in this case, you can see that our correct answer will be choice B. We'll have 22, 77, 11, 32, and 999. Let's try one more practice. How can I calculate the number of comparisons needed to sort this array? 
the approach is actually similar to what we did in selection sort. In the first pass, notice I need to compare four times. I need to compare one and two, two and three, three and four, and four and five. The second time, I need to compare three times because my last value has already been sorted. Then the following time, I only need to compare two times. And the very last time, I only compare once. So once again, the total number of comparisons will be 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. We see that the number of comparisons increases by about n squared as our list increases in size. Let's now talk about our last sorting algorithm, which is insertion sort. We often describe insertion sort as similar to the way that people shuffle and sort a deck of cards. So if you've played any games with a set of playing cards, it's very similar to the way many people sort a hand of cards. So in insertion sort, the idea is that you read your array starting with index 0 and continuing until all items have been read. And each time a new item is read, you check the value and insert the item at the correct position in the sorted portion. The animation on the right illustrates what's happening here. So you can see, first, we check our first value and we treat that as our sorted item. Then we move the five in front of our six so that our sorted portion is in increasing order. The three gets placed in front of the five to keep the sorted portion in order. Our one will also be placed in front of the three because we want to sort the sorted portion in order. The 8 is going to stay right where it is so that the sorted portion's in order. Then 7 gets inserted between 6 and 8. So basically, each time a new item is read, we check its value and we insert the item at the correct position in the sorted portion. And we keep going until our entire array has been sorted. Like with our other algorithms, we see that the unsorted portion decreases by 1, and the sorted portion grows by 1 with each iteration. Let's go through a quick example step by step. So our first step is to let the very first item in our array be the first sorted value. Next, we read the value that comes after. 2 is less than 5, so we insert 2 in front of 5. Our sorted portion now contains the 2 and the 5. In our next step, we read the next item in our unsorted portion, which is 1. 1 is smaller than both 2 and 5, so we insert it at the beginning. Finally, we read our zero in the fourth position. That also gets inserted at the front, and the other items are shifted down. And finally, when we reach the last item, that three, we insert the three into the sorted portion. So we insert three between two and five. And now our list is fully sorted. So insertion sort is actually a very nice program to code up, and it doesn't take too much code at all. Let's go ahead and run this example so you can see how it works. 
So for this insertion sort example, we've written a couple of functions. We have one function called insert item, and that item will basically help us insert and swap the items appropriately. So it will insert the item between the two indexes where we want that item to be placed. And then the insertion sort function here will basically read through our array and insert each small item such that the items are placed in order. So it's actually a very straightforward algorithm to code up. Basically just have to have an if statement to check if my current value is less than the one before it, then I perform that swap. So if we run insertion sort, you see if we have a list of unsorted data, we are able to successfully place those numbers in order. So this concludes our introduction to multidimensional arrays and searching and sorting algorithms. You should now be able to more comfortably write programs and functions using 1D and multidimensional arrays. Definitely use the sandbox and the examples we've covered to help you practice. Also, make sure you can recognize the differences between selection sort, bubble sort, and insertion sort. Often I like to ask quiz or exam questions asking how those algorithms work. So it's important that you understand the procedures that each algorithm uses. Finally, and you should know that big O notation can be used to compare algorithm performance. I don't expect you to know the algorithms that we did not cover in detail, but you'll learn more about big O notation and different kinds of sorting algorithms if you take some more advanced programming courses. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions on this material. And in our next video, we're going to take a closer look at real world applications of 1D and 2D arrays. And you'll see that for many applications in programming, science, and engineering, being able to manipulate arrays is incredibly useful. So we'll go ahead and cover that in our next video. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you in the next video.